Would you take your Bibles, please? Hebrews chapter 2. The book of Hebrews, New Testament, toward the end of the New Testament, chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 17. Verse 17. While you're turning, I want to take a moment and do some spiritual nostalgia. In 1958, my family moved from a small town on the Kansas-Oklahoma border to Kavanaugh, Arkansas. When we first moved to Kavanaugh, my dad was not yet a believer. My mother was. She had been a Southern Baptist, raised all of her life. I'm the oldest of four children at that time. We had another child added about two years later to our family. But when we moved to Kavanaugh, my folks needed a washing machine, and so they went to Sears in Fort Smith to buy a washing machine. And when I say a washing machine, it had a ringer on the top of it with the old tub. Some of you know what that is. Some of you have no clue. And while she was talking to the lady, she said, where do we deliver this washing machine? She said, well, you go out south of Fort Smith, the Kavanaugh area. And she said, have you all found a church home? My mother said, no, I'm looking for a Southern Baptist church. And the lady said, well, I'm a Southern Baptist, and I go to Rye Hill Baptist Church. So short time after that, my mother took me and my brothers and my sister, and we showed up at Rye Hill Baptist Church early in 1959, My dad was not yet going to church at that time. And since I had become a believer in Kansas, my mother and I became members of Rye Hill Baptist Church in 1959. The pastor at that time built a relationship with my dad. And so my father and my brother David accepted Christ here. We're baptized. 1960, my folks have been renting a house in Kavanaugh. They bought a house in Fort Smith. So we moved to Fort Smith and joined the old Kelly Heights Baptist Church, which became the Windsor Park Baptist Church at that time. That's another whole story. But I just want to say that there's a very soft spot in my heart Rye Hill Baptist Church. Jesus Christ is not only our Savior, and oh, what a Savior He is. When Jesus left this world, He went back to the right hand of the Father. And when He went there, He became our great High Priest. There are two qualifications to be an effective priest. You may or may not know what they are. But an effective priest, and by the way, you are a priest. Do you remember in the song the choir sang when they sang from Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, and he has made us to be a kingdom and priest unto our God? And if you read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, and 1 Peter 2 verse 10, you'll find that the moment you got saved, you became a priest. The reason you became a priest is because your great high priest made you one. Now, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 says it this way, Therefore in all things, Jesus had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. There were two qualifications that Jesus had to fulfill in order to be an adequate, a sufficient, and in fact a great high priest. He had to become merciful And he had to become faithful. Now, if God is up here, and if we are down here, 
A priest is someone in between the two who represents God down to that individual. And likewise, he represents that individual up to God. The priest is a mediator. He's an intercessor. And in order for Jesus to become the great high priest, he had first of all to become merciful so that he would understand what it's like for people to live where we live. I want you to know, life, this side of heaven, is not fair. Life, this side of heaven, is full of things like COVID-19. And there's nothing fair about COVID, is there? There's nothing fair about cancer. There's nothing fair about losing your job. Usually. Life, this side of heaven, is not fair. And Jesus, in order to become our great high priest, had to come here so that he could see what we go through, experience what it's like to be tired, experience what it's like to be ridiculed and mocked. Experience what it's like to have people hate you. Experience what it's like to to see people hurt from all kinds of illnesses. Jesus had to come here so that he could become merciful, compassionate. But while he's here, he's not here just to learn about us to understand us. While He's here, He's here to walk by faith and please the Father. Now, you may never heard it said that way before, but I'm going to say that again. Jesus had to learn to walk by faith and always please the Father. He had to become faithful in all things. So in order to be our great high priest, Jesus became merciful. He was already merciful. But he learned how to be more merciful by going through what we go through. And he learned to trust the Father. That's taught in this very chapter. In fact, look at verse 13. And again, I will put my trust in Him is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 17, talking about Isaiah having to learn to trust God. But it's also a prophecy of the Messiah. The Messiah would come, and the Messiah also would learn to trust God. Now, you're a priest. Have you ever prayed for anyone? Yes? Yes. You were interceding. How good are you at that? Are you really good at praying for others? You want to know how to get better? Let the Holy Spirit develop more mercy in your life. Let the Holy Spirit develop more faithfulness in your life. Your effectiveness in intercessory prayer requires the same two qualifications that God the Father required of Jesus to be our great high priest. He had to become more merciful and he had to prove himself faithful and the more God can depend on you to be faithful to Him, the better your prayer life will be and the better intercessor you'll become. Isn't that amazing? Had you ever thought of that? That to me was a brand new thought. I've been in church all my life, but I'd never realized the correlation between the power of intercessory prayer depending on one's mercy 
and their faithfulness. Well, in order for Jesus Christ to become our merciful and faithful high priest, there are three great tasks that he had to perform. No one else could do these three things. He had to do something absolutely unique in all of history and all of creations. And Jesus Christ, oh, what a Savior he is. He's the only one in all of existence who could do these three great tasks. Here they are, number one. Number one, Jesus had to leave heaven and come to earth and become like us. He had to become a real human being. Does anybody remember Psalm 8? Psalm 8 is a wonderful psalm. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visiteth him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and, and honor. In other words, mankind is a little bit beneath the angels in the hierarchy of heavenly things. But look here in this chapter. He quotes that verse. Do you see it in verse 6? But one testified in a certain place. Well, that was the psalmist in Psalm 8. What is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. And it goes on. But look after the quotation in verse 8. For in that he put all subjection under him, he left nothing that's not put under him. But now we do not see all things put under him. We don't see everything under man's control. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Jesus became a real man. The one who created the angels and is above the angels goes beneath the angels and he takes on human flesh and blood and he's actually born as a baby boy. And then it tells us in verse 11, For he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. And that's a quotation from Psalm 22, the prayer of a righteous man who suffers unjustly but wins the victory of faith the way that Jesus won the victory of faith on the cross when he cries, it is finished. He says, I'll declare your name to my brothers in the assembly, the assembly of God's people. He's talking about everybody that gets saved as his brother. That's us. So Jesus becomes like us. And again, I'll put my trust in him. I'll I'll trust the Father just like they trust the Father. And, and again, here am I, the children whom God has given me, again from Isaiah chapter 8. But look at verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have are become partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, for indeed, he did not give aid to angels. He didn't come to save angels. But he gives aid to the seed of Abram. That's, that's descendants of Abram. That's people. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. He knows what it's like have trials and temptations and problems and enemies, and he understands. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men. In order to become our high priest, he has to become a man so he can be taken from among men to become our high priest is appointed for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant 
and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. You say, Jesus wasn't subject to any weakness. Why did he get tired? Why did he hurt? Why was he disappointed when people turned their backs on him? He understands us. As human, he understands us. As God, he understands us because he looks on the heart, not on the outside. So why did he do this? So he could become a merciful high priest. But he did this for us so that we could be some, something. He became a man so that you and I can become like him. And when you get saved, you are rebirthed spiritually. You become a child of God. And now as a child of God, you grow. And what do you grow to become like? You grow to become more and more like Jesus. You show me a person who's mature, I'll show you a person who's like Jesus. Right? That's what maturity is. And Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, are marvelous verses. It says that one of these days, the Lord is going to return, and when He returns, these vile old bodies that you and I are wearing right now around our spirits, they're going to drop off of our spirits, and we're going to be reclothed with heavenly bodies that are like His bodies, and we will be like Him. So Jesus, to be a great high priest, had to come and become a man so He could learn to be merciful to us sinners. And so He could save us and make us to be children of God. There's a second great task Jesus had to do. Look at chapter 4, verse 14. Chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, and look at those next words, yet without sin. Jesus had to go through every kind of temptation that all of us will face or any of us will face. And yet, even though we have all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, Jesus Christ never sinned once. You say, but he got angry in the temple. Or he got angry in Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 in the synagogue. Yes, he did. You should too. You see, there's a difference between unrighteous anger and righteous anger. And righteous anger is not self-righteous anger. Self-righteous anger is unrighteous anger. But righteous anger is being angry at what God gets angry with. And it's getting angry only in ways that please God. And when Jesus got angry and He cleansed the temple, He pleased the Father. And when Jesus got angry in Mark chapter 3, He didn't just get angry he pleased the Father because there's one thing that God despises. He despises a hard heart that has no compassion. There are some things we Christians need to get angry about. But we need to get angry in a godly way. 
the anger of Jesus did not take him out of control. He always did the right thing in his anger. So the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Jesus never sinned, not even once. Look at chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 26. It says this, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who's holy. What's the word holy mean? Set apart from sin. Harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then for the people. Why? Because he had no sin. Wow. Look at chapter 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Notice it said, who offered Himself, how? Without spot. Like a lamb without blemish or spot. In the old covenant, the lamb on the altar had to be spotless. In the new covenant, The lamb who dies on the cross has to be spotless. He must be sinless. Otherwise, he cannot be our substitute. So Jesus Christ has to go through life sinless. Did he hide out away from the world because he was afraid of sinning? No. He took Satan on. He took the world on. He took sinful men on. And He took us all on with honesty and integrity and confidence in the Father. And He never sinned, not even once. So He never sinned. So He could become our substitute. But listen to this. He never sinned. In fact, turn with me to 1 Peter. Just a few pages past Hebrews. 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's begin in verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. It says this. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in His mouth. There it is again, Jesus never sinned. Who, when He was reviled, did not revile in return. When He suffered, He did not threaten. He committed Himself to Him who judges righteously, who Himself bore our sins in His own body. That's why He didn't sin, so He could bear our sins. But look at this. It says that we, having died to sins, might live to righteousness. Whoa. He didn't die for your sins just so your sins would be forgiven. He died for your sins so you can die every day to a life of sin, and every day you can arise to a new life living the life of God. Amen? We're saved to live for Christ. He didn't save you just so you can go to heaven. He saved you so you can start living for Him right now. Now, if you will, go to chapter 5. and We find in Hebrews chapter 5, in order to begin the start of the sentence, let's back up to verse 6. But We're going to read verses 7 through 9 with it. And it says this. He also says in another place, speaking to Christ, You're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. 
who in the days of his flesh, when Jesus was here on earth, when he had offered up prayers and supplications. Now supplications are not just requests. Supplications are urgent requests. Times when you're in anguish. Times when disasters are hitting. And it says that Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. How do he make these prayers? With vehement cries. He's crying out loud. He's not praying silently. He's crying at the top of his voice to his Father. And tears, his tears are, are flowing when he cries. And I think we know what this prayer is. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is, that's what he says on the cross. But even before that, Father, is there any way for this cup to pass from me? Nevertheless, not my will, yours be done. Luke tells us when he prayed that, he sweat drops of blood. So Jesus is crying to the Father. And he was heard because of his godly fear. God said, I'm not going to take the cup away, son. I'll give you an angel to strengthen you. That's in Luke 22. And then it says, He was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by what he suffered and having been, what's the next word? Perfected. Having been perfected. Wait a minute. We just established Jesus never sinned. Jesus was always morally perfect in heaven, and when Jesus came to earth, he was morally perfect on, heaven, on earth. And when he, he went back to heaven, he's still morally perfect. And millions of years from today, through all of eternity, he'll always be morally perfect, right? What does this mean? He became perfect. Look at chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their... That's Jesus, the captain of our salvation. It's talking about God the Father, making the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings. There it is. And it's going to say it again. It's going to say it again over in chapter 9 that he becomes perfect through sufferings. What is this? The incarnation is true. Jesus left heaven and became a real man. The sinless life of Jesus is true. He never sinned. However, that wasn't enough to save us. Before he could save us, he had to suffer. He had to become the sacrifice on the altar. He had to die bearing our sins in his body and washing us from sins with his blood. And sometimes we just talk about we're saved by the blood, but we don't talk about we're saved by his body. But it's not either or, it's both and. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It's one thing to have your sins forgiven. But our sins were placed on Jesus like they were placed on the scapegoat by the high priest in the Old Covenant and the scapegoat was sent outside the camp. And it removed the sins. And Jesus doesn't just forgive us our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He removes our sins. And I like that. I like that. Now, Jesus had to suffer 
and bear our sins, he had to die. And then he had to conquer death and the grave and Satan. Amen? And when he arose victorious from the grave, now he is fit to be our great high priest. He passed all three tests. He became a man. He lived without sin. He was perfected by his sufferings. That's what it meant for him. Here's what it means for you and me. The Apostle Paul says, In Ephesians, I want to know Him. I want to know the fellowship of His sufferings. Remember that passage? The fellowship of His sufferings. And James, right after the book of Hebrews, is going to share this. James chapter 2, beginning... Is that the right verse? Hang on a second. James chapter 1, I'm sorry. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete. In other words, God wants to perfect you and me, but in order to perfect us, we have to go through suffering. Suffering and hardships and tough times are the tools of the Holy Spirit to perfect our characters. It's the way that Christ was perfected to be our Savior. And it's the way that you and I are perfected to be God's servants. Wow. That's something. God been working on you lately? Going through some tough times? What's God doing? He's working on the fruit of the Spirit in your life. He's working on your character. Amen. All right. Let's tie it together. Jesus had to be merciful. Jesus had to be faithful in order to be our great high priest. In order to become merciful and faithful, he had to become a man, never sin, and be perfected by sufferings. You and I, we're called to die to sin and live to righteousness. That involves dying daily. That involves allowing the Spirit to change us so we become like Jesus. Where are you at right now? Spiritually, where are you? God knows right where you're at. I don't. I have no clue where you're at. God looks on your heart. God looks on my heart. Is there someone today that would have to say, Brother Mike, I have to honestly say, I don't have much mercy. Mercy's hard for me. Is there someone here that the Holy Spirit's saying, you really need to work on faithfulness. You're hit and miss. You're hot and you're cold. It's time you quit being hot and cold and got faithful for God. Amen? Is there someone here today that you haven't been dying to sin daily and that sin is ensnaring you again and is pulling you down even though you're a child of God? Or is it time that you said, as a child of God, 
I really need to grow spiritually. I'm not enough like Jesus yet. I just want to become more like Jesus. Pray. And let God work in your heart today. The last thing is this. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, oh, what a Savior. You know, if you're the only person that ever sinned, Jesus would have done this for you. Jesus is the only one who can save you from your sins. Listen to me, folks. If you're here today and you're not saved, there's three facts you need to know. Number one, you're a lost sinner and you can't save yourself. Number two, the only person in the whole universe that can save you is Jesus. And number three, if you die before you accept Jesus, you're not going to heaven, you're going to hell. That's the three things you need to know. That's how the Holy Spirit convicts a person who's lost. If the Spirit's convicting you, maybe He was convicting you before you got here today. You need Jesus. You come receive Jesus. Would you stand? We're going to pray. We're going to sing. You obey the Lord. Almighty Father, Lord, Your Word is true. Your Word is powerful. It's not the preacher that's important. The preacher's just a mouthpiece. Or what's important is Your Word and Your Spirit. Lord, unless Your Spirit moves in hearts, there is no change. But God, I pray that You would change us in this place today. I pray that there would be some who would come and be set free from the chains of sin. They would experience amazing grace. Know what it's like to be a child of God. But Lord, for those of us that are saved, Lord, help us to learn from these Scriptures and apply them to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.